the ability to pick up on all of those signals is one of the mysteries and blessings of being the human species. And that's why everyone can learn it if they choose to. And the difference that people have in feeling significant, feeling heard, liking the other person, building some kind of conscious connection sets these individuals apart. Welcome to the Delighted Customers Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Slayton, and I'm so glad you're here. I empower leaders to turn indifferent customers into loyal fans. I talk to guests with a wide range of expertise who share meaningful insights and wisdom. We give you practical tips and proven frameworks and share ways to help you delight your customers. Well, I'm excited to have yet another guest from across the pond today in the UK. I'm so excited to have Sandra Thompson on the show. Sandra, I met in in Michigan, in East Lansing. She was presenting to a group of, of faculty and students at Michigan State University. And I felt her story and, and what she shared was so compelling and so relevant to the world of CX that I asked if she would be so kind as to join me on the Delighted Customers podcast. So with that, Sandra, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And and I think the critical thing is when you asked, I don't actually think you finished your sentence. I think I just said, yes, please, that would be great. <laughs> well, I, I so appreciate it. And uh, by the way, before we go any further, like you could read me the phone book. I love, you know, I'm sure you, I, I'm the one with the accent, but I love the way you talk. That's very kind. Um, <laughs> And uh, interestingly, my accents tend to change. So some of my ancestry is in Wales. And so when I go to Wales, I definitely find that I take up a bit of an accent there um, and it turns into a bit of Welsh. So you definitely got the English version today, Mark. Love it. Love it. All right. So um, so the topic is, is emotional intelligence. I'll kind of share the headline. Uh, but the way you shared it, um, she had these, one of the things that I'm sure you get people remember all the time is these jelly beans that I've never seen before. And, you know, there's like a, a left and a right or a yin and a yang jelly bean and you, they look the same, but they taste very different. Uh, and one is a very good tasting and one is an awful or not so good tasting jelly bean. I don't know how they make these things, but anyway, um, a great example of using an illustration to uh, share a lesson about emotional intelligence. But before we get into that, would you mind sharing with the audience um, what led you up to, to what you're doing now and how you got uh, involved in the world of customer experience management? Of course. Um, the first thing I think to explain is that I've always been curious about people, the decisions they make, the behavior they display, why they do what they do. So I started my career out in marketing, in actual fact, and I did about 20 years in a number of different roles, fascinated again on how the communication with the customer could influence their behavior. At one particular point in my marketing career, I was invited to get involved in a customer relationship management, so more of a data project. They asked me really just to define the requirements. But at that point, I'd learned some new stuff over in New York, believe it or not. I'd gone over for a week to learn about customer experience because we were doing customer service in the UK. We weren't really doing customer experience. And so when I was invited to get involved in this CRM program, I thought this is my opportunity. So I said, let's change it. Let's not do CRM. Let's do patient experience. Let's try that. So drew it all up, actually applied everything I'd learned. And that for me was so obvious. It was as if I had to leave marketing behind, but bring with me some skills that I'd learned in that area and start that journey. So shortly after we created this program 
in the patient experience world, I started working for myself. And that's really when I realized customer experience is incredible. There's an awful lot to it, but there's quite a lot of process. There's quite a lot of what I would call assuming rational thinking. And that's not how we're wired because about 20 odd years ago, I did a master's degree and I was invited to write about whatever I wanted, which was a disaster. It took me ages to decide. But I came across this book by Daniel Goleman, Emotional Intelligence. You know, perhaps IQ isn't what you think it is or there's more to life or higher performers don't necessarily have IQ. They have this thing called EQ. So I read that book from cover to cover. I wrote my dissertation about emotional intelligence and I started to become quite curious about how the brain worked. I was following quite a few people um, through social media, a kind of more, more kind of later on in my career, who were neuroscientists and psychologists. And so we get to probably about 10 years from now, and I, re, I go back to emotional intelligence and I see how much it's evolved, how many more people are writing about it. And about five years ago, I learned how to develop the skill. So there's a real important point in here where I studied it academically. I understood it from a knowledge point of view. But about five years ago, I started to practice. So I was taught how to become more emotionally intelligent by some of the most incredible coaches I've ever met in my life. So I was very lucky. You get to this point now, I've been teaching it. I've been uh, teaching young people 18, 19, 20 to develop the skill. I also teach and, and train people on how to develop that skill. Um, and I find now the kind of work that I'm doing because of the very nature of what I know and where my interests lie, I end up doing stuff in customer experience and employee experience because we know we can't do anything in the CX space without employees being willing, capable and competent to communicate with others. Okay, excellent. And and you are the so then you found you're the founding director of EI Evolution. And could you share with me sort of how you help your clients? It's a fascinating question. And I'm a little bit different perhaps to other consultants in that I listen to what the problem is and then I'll draw from a portfolio of stuff in how I'm going to solve it. So what does that mean? That means someone might come to me and say, we've got an issue in our customer contact center. Can you help us? We want to increase our NPS or we want to have an impact on our CSAT or we've got a problem with attrition. We've got problem with staff leaving or we want to do more in our talent. Sometimes I'm invited to design and execute a customer experience transformation program, which is always a delight. And other times I might just be brought in to do journey mapping or my version of it, which is weather mapping, which brings emotion and a different lexicon, if you like, to how it's normally done. So it's very much a case of, luckily for me, People who've known me for years just saying, we've got this thing. What would you do? Oh, I'd do it this or I'd do that. Oh, OK. Come and have a chat. And that's how it happens. I'm very lucky. Well, you're you're lucky. You're, you've got this incredible uh, toolkit to pull from to to help solve problems. And I, I know you're a good listener. Um, and emotional intelligence. I remember um, going double clicking on that for a minute, you shared at that same conference. The, so the first day before it actually started was faculty and students and you presented to us, but then the conference started and you were one of the keynote speakers there. And I remember this one slide with, which really resonated with me, which was um, a quote and I'll, I'll let you share it, but it was 95% of decisions. It was a study were based on emotion. So to share more about that. That's exactly right. We believe we even try and fool ourselves that we're making a very rational decision. Mm. In actual fact, 
when we peel back the layers of the onion, the decision that we've made is emotional. Mm. We post rationalize it. Then we start going into the features and the reasons why and, and all of the specification of the thing. So if we think for a second about some of the choices that we've made, it's highly likely that that's a need for recognition, significance, association, what it says about me, what it says about my future me, what I want to feel like when I do this thing, rather than the practical implication. Because if you think about it, you could go into a store and buy a functional thing for a functional purpose. But then there's this other thing that does the same thing, but it's got this very sexy brand. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you an example here. A long time ago, I remember working with someone who had a particular brand of laptop. And he said, I love this computer. It's so great. It does everything I need it to do. And I said, well, I choose this other brand because actually I seemed, and this is this is this is a confession for me, I seem to fit in with everyone else that's in the room because they're all using this brand that I've chosen. Sure enough, three weeks later, uh, I think I'm gonna get your brand because when <laughs> I turned up, I looked like I looked like I didn't know what I was doing, an amateur. What does it say about me? So that's a classic yeah. example of emotion-led decision-making. That's around what he thought it represented by having this thing rather than this other thing. I'm trying not to say all the brands here, Mark, but I think we might know yeah. might be. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I, uh, Charlie Green, who wrote The Trusted Advisor, is a, is a friend and someone I was I was a member of his group uh, 15 years ago or something like that. He talks about uh, all, nearly all the buying decisions are based on emotion and justified with rationale. And he talks about this sort of there's a functional need that's sort of a, okay, it, it needs to be able to do a certain minimal thing. Yeah. Um, if you're doing, if we, we go from the simple thing, like I need a screwdriver to, to, um, unscrew, unscrew a piece of hardware in my house. Right. And so it functionally, but then I have a whole bunch I can choose from. Yeah. But if you scale that and then, then which one am I going to choose? Well, I could choose the Sears Craftsman because I know it's guaranteed for life. I could choose this other one because I like the packaging, whatever. And then, Usually the one I pick, because there's sev several that are within a range, is the one that I have some sort of a emotional feeling about. Mm -hmm. Once I own it, now it becomes mine. Yeah, exactly. And I completely understand that. My partner recently had to choose a new car. <laughs> Unfortunately <laughs> for him, he involved me in the, in the buying decision. Nice. And I was like, oh, listen to that. Listen to how the door closes. Don't be ridiculous. This gets you from A to B. But I decided that I love this particular car because I felt a million dollars in it. And he's like, but this other one, I've read like really great reviews. And so when we then delivered when the car was delivered he now is okay with it but at first he was saying we should have had the other car blah, 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 blah. but now he's feeling an emotional attachment to it thank goodness Whew. yeah and just just uh by the way my condolences for going car shopping with anyone uh <laughs> but but joe pine who who wrote the experience economy um he he is he's talked about the theory of economic uh, progression and and what what people um, evolve to and how society has evolved from you know original manufacturing and industrial and and you getting to the point of not only is it how we use a product in different uh, scenarios but the different modes that we're in so we may want to we may be traveling just just buying a, a coke you know, yeah. or, or as cola drink, you know, I want, I'm willing to pay, you know, $5 at the movie theater for, uh, but if, if I'm at, uh, a, a, a McDonald's, I'm not going to spend $5 for a Coke. 
mm-hmm. and and how it gets packaged and so forth. So it's like, how does the how do we understand from and this involves the emotional piece, how do we understand what consumers want as they go through different aspects of their life? Mm. So the product, he says, also connected to that is they're interested in transforming. Like, how can I be changed for the better, whatever that means to me, Mm. by using or engaging with your product or service? Yeah, that's right. It's absolutely about how you feel as a consequence. And that's why this emotional intelligence skill is so critical, because if we take an example, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my partner and I stayed at a hotel, which which was a treat. It was a treat for us. We do it once a year. It's a bit of a pre-Christmas thing. Now, at any point along that journey, even of arrival, it could have gone horribly wrong because there were so many things that make this particular place so incredibly special, but it relies on the people to consistently deliver it. That's why we choose this place. And it is, you know, you have to book it well in advance. It's very, very busy, but every single person has a role. They have a kind of piece of little piece of the chain in this great big chain on a bike, whatever you want to call it. And all of them performed impeccably. If one of them had been a little bit grumpy or a little bit offhand or not worked out what was going on for myself and my partner, the need to respond in the moment, it wouldn't be my first recommendation in the future but they absolutely know how to show up and how to respond in the moment to the changing vibe of the customer critically important yeah so so well said i love that example i love the tradition you guys have that's a great tradition hopefully you can do it every year uh you know a pre-christmas little break there um, and and to your point, like I think so much of of CX is being very intentional um, and strategic and thoughtful about w- w- thinking about what your customers' desires are, what their needs are, and 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 sharing that and making that part of your culture, and that has to require emotional intelligence right and so if you would respond to that but also if you would for the audience share what emotional intelligence actually is and maybe what it's not sure um thank you and i i'm going to come back to the point of intentionality as well because we've got to be really careful with that Mm. um and i'd like to pose a thought for your for your listeners to consider so the first thing then emotional intelligence so there are a variety of different um definitions available out there Uh, i choose the daniel goleman one which is really about recognizing and understanding your own emotions and then once you've done that Having the ability to recognize and influence and build relationships with others. Because emotional intelligence isn't just about you, it's about this amazing thing called emotional contagion, which is all of us, whether we're watching one another on the screen or whether we're in the physical space with one another, we give off a kind of energy. And it's a really weird thing that Mm. I can't quite, uh, I can't quite define in its own right, but we do have a vibe. We have an energy, we have a presence. You're going to know if I'm not feeling all that happy. You're going to know if there's a tension in the room you're going to know if i'm feeling super excited or slightly nervous you're going to pick up on that when you have learned the skill yourself you become more sensitive to how others are showing up so that's really what that definition is all about you and about your relationship with others and building that relationship as a consequence of that work Hmm. 
And that's, that's great. And I have a feeling I know where you're going to go with this, but I'm not sure. So let me, let me follow up to what you had a second thought about, which is the idea of being intentional about CX and intentional about being emotionally intelligent organizationally. Mm. Many organizations believe that they can design particular experiences knowing that the customer will, as a consequence of that experience that's been designed, be happy, be delighted, be excited. But what we know is, of course, every single individual has a different set of expectations. My expectation of this type of hotel will be X, of this type of hotel will be Y. Coming back to a point you made earlier, if I'm on a business trip, my expectation is A. If I'm with my family, it's B. So not only have I got quite a complex set of expectations based on my values, on my previous experiences, my perception of who you are and what you do, being intentional needs to very much be about the intention to be of service to whatever shows up, yeah. not an intention to, in inverted commas, delight, and definitely not, in inverted commas, the intention to make someone happy. Because I might not want to be happy, I'm going to want you to be efficient. And then I'm going to be satisfied that you've done what you need to do. And then when I come away, I'll be happy. There are thousands of different emotions. They're so incredibly unique to every single one of us. While we've got some headlines, you know, of sad and happy and some others that are out there, it's really difficult to provide a blanket set of words and say to staff, right, we've designed these journeys with the intention of all of our customers feeling X, Y, and Z. They might not need to feel X, Y, and Z to really like working with you. Mm, nice. Um, and I, I, I can really appreciate that. And, and what, it, what I think it speaks to is be careful of being too scripted. Think in terms of principles rather than rules. Perfect. Yeah. So I, I think this is a good time. I, I may have, as as you were talking, I think I may have accidentally set a hook for the listeners when I talked about the jelly bean story. And it may come in, uh, this may be a good time for you to shed some light on the purpose of that and how it relates to what you just shared. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the jelly beans. What? So here's confession time, okay? I've never eaten those jelly beans because Smart. I do not want to taste liver and onion <sighs> toothpaste. I mean, <sighs> okay, well, that might be okay, but that type of toothpaste doesn't sound very nice. Bogies, sorry, everyone, but there is one. And vomit. I mean, come on. Stinky fish. Anyway, moving on. The purpose of it. So... We remember things, and I know that you know this, we remember sights and smells and tastes. We, there are so many things that trigger memory, but rarely in training do you have taste, smell, and other stimulus that actually is a visceral, is a visceral experience. And I remember someone speaking to me, this is years ago, years and years ago, and they were saying, you know, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth when you have a bad experience. So I was like, ah, here it is. And when I found these absolutely criminal sweets, I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this roulette game of here are the, here are the sweets pick five and then when we're all ready we're going to eat them and write down a happy or, a, or an unhappy face <laughs> please can you get some water please can you go and get the bin please can you get a napkin because I don't know how it's going to turn out but the point behind all of this which is the question you were asking me Mark you don't know what you're going to get 
So you go to take the jelly bean, put it in your mouth. <gasps> it's nice. Whew, lovely. The anticipation. You put it in your mouth and it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. When we deliver bad customer experiences, and worse than that, when we deliver bad customer experiences and we make the complaint process painful, arduous, guilt-ridden, <clears throat> let's get the long list out, you mm. are making that the liver and onion jelly bean because people still say to me weeks after that game, I can still taste that particular jelly bean. We... We do create when we get it wrong and we don't remedy the situation fast enough. We do create physical responses in our customers because when they are enraged, when they feel that they have been dealt with unfairly, when they go through something called rumination, which is why did that happen? Why couldn't they listen to me? Why couldn't they solve it? It is as significant as eating one of those awful jelly beans. We do have a physical response to it. So my invitation to um, those that are taking part in this exercise is to make sure it's not a surprise. Make sure that everything that you communicate gives the customer the reassurance that it's going to be okay. And then when you deliver the experience, make sure it fits at least with what they think they're going to get. And if you can make it a bit nicer too and meaningful to them, then they're going to remember it for the right reasons. If you promise one thing, deliver something that's awful, the memory then is going to be not positive. Plus, when they continue to work with you, they'll be filled with trepidation because they don't know what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point about not only the logical aspects of the experience, but there's the emotional piece and, you know, there, and it's, it's easy to understate the emotional piece, both positively and negatively. And this idea of how you respond when things go wrong is such that's a good right. point because let's face it, no matter how good you are, things are going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and so there is sort of a potential inflection point moment of truth for customer loyalty to either go way up. You've heard of service recovery when you can do a better job of recovering a customer who's had a not so great experience or the opposite in, in the case where, you know, well, why do you want to disconnect from your cable television service? Well, let me send you over to who the the care what do, what do they call them i mean really it's last chance department but they have a name for them um yeah. and, and and you're to your point all those emotions you're feeling guilty you're feeling judged you're feeling like you did something wrong for leaving them um and people get paid basically on saving customers that are in that bucket mm. and the really interesting point here is that very often I speak about uh, customer, you know, B, B2C, but, you know, B2B, it's even more damaging mm -hmm. because it's the risk, it's their internal reputation, it's their status, you know, the relationship that a client has with a vendor is filled with so much uncertainty that you've I, I perceive in some industries in some b2b environments you've got to work even harder to ensure that you make it as easy as possible for this person to feel reassured certain and and really proud that they've made the right decision to go with you because the ripple effect of something going wrong is their reputation and all of the departments that then got, have got to try and sort it out if the problem does arise. So we really need to think carefully about those jelly beans and the fact that in a B2B environment, metaphorically, it's not just your client, it's the finance, the marketing, the sales director, the CEO, 
all behind the scenes that are also eating that evil tasting jelly bean if you don't get it right. Yeah. And by, by the way, uh, <clears throat> I, having been both a student in, uh, uh, I'll call it a training that Sandra led, as well as an audience member during a keynote, I would highly recommend her. And I can tell you just on her passion for the topic alone and her, her knowledge and all, all that she's been through, she, she'd be a fantastic person to have as, as part of your organization. I want to I want to ask a question related to organization because if you're listening and you're a, a business leader and you're thinking, you know, yeah, I don't want my customers to feel that way, what are some ways that I can use EI with my team members to help avoid those those down for those pitfalls? It's a great question and and firstly, thank you uh, for your kind words. <laughs> that's very nice. I've gone a bit red, but that's okay. Uh, on the point of learning the skill, so there are four domains to emotional intelligence, and emotional self-awareness is the first. So if you're looking for your team to develop their skill, they may already have good levels of emotional intelligence. Some might need to work harder than others, who knows. But the first thing I would invite people to do is to notice their emotion. So if you're able to stop for a moment when that very incendiary email comes in before you respond to it, what exactly is going on? Well, I can't believe they said that, but, 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 okay. So what is, why is that? Why is it that you're feeling that way? You know, ask yourself this question. What is that thing that I'm feeling? Well, I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling insulted. I'm feeling defensive. Blah, 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 blah. Why might that be? Well, because duh, 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 duh. so if you're able to start naming your emotions, you are more likely to be able to deal with them because what happens here is that as soon as you're able to say actually that emotion's fine then the amygdala the oldest part of the brain goes okay all good no problem if you don't name it and it gets out of control because you don't make the choice to take a moment to decompress then you're going to do something which is a reaction which actually is going to cause you more hassle because ultimately that person then is going to react and so it goes ping pong. So the first invitation is to think about what you're feeling. Now, you can do that in a number of ways. You can, uh, I will include this as a, as a downloadable link actually for your listeners. There's this okay. amazing um, stack of cards, basically. Uh, it's, a, it's a box of cards. It has... Um, names of emotions within it even if you cracked open this box of cards or you download the low res version and pick out some cards that have the words on it that describe how you feel to help you find the words to describe it that's a really good start as well and you can use that card though you can use those cards to make conscious decisions on how you might like to feel as well so rather than dealing with your team and helping them respond rather than react. You can get them to identify the positive things they'd like to feel and then describe what happens in order for them to feel that way. So for example, if they want to feel, if they want to, they want to enhance their curiosity or if they want to feel excited or energized, have a conversation and say, well, what needs to happen for you to feel like that? And either they will take control of that and do that for themselves, or maybe you as the leader might encourage particular activities or tasks that bring those to life. So I guess the, the bottom line here is recognizing that emotion does exist. Lots of organizations say to me, we don't have emotion here. Okay, so uh, do you ever get stressed? Yes, we do. Okay, well, that, that's an emotion in itself. So Firstly, recognizing that emotions happen. Secondly, recognizing that emotions influence behavior. If you're not liking how you're showing up, you can influence how that emotion kind of carries on. 
choosing emotions and doing things that can amplify particular types of emotions. That's the first thing. And a very long-winded response. (laughs) Well, what would you say? So I I love it. And I think my short answer would be hire Sandra to come (laughs) and do some training. Um, But there's a lot of great resources out there and uh, that, you know, whether it's books, trainings, videos, et cetera. But I think the idea that you as a CEO or a leader of an organization are aware that, you know, these things are real issues and, um, and there's something that you can do about them ultimately to improve both the employee and the customer experience. Sandra, what would you say to the average person who says, well, I just don't have e- yeah, I wasn't born with good emotional intelligence. You know, I just, there are certain people I know, like I have an aunt Gloria voice. She's really good at it, but I wasn't, I wasn't on that line when they were handing out those things on the, on the birth line. What would you say to them? Um, I would say that this is a skill that can be learned. No doubt about it. And the reason why I know this to be true, I worked with a gentleman who was hugely effective. He worked within a a particular department that dealt with the politics and the policy at government level. Mm. He was very kind of process-led, quite a harsh character, but you knew that if you asked him to do something or you asked an opinion, you'd get something straight back. I met him, I left that organization, I met him four years later, Mike, Mike, what's happened? This is incredible. I can actually tell you are completely engaged with everything that I'm saying. You're asking me amazing questions. What happened? I've been coached. I've learned how to manage my emotions, to understand the impact I have on others. But here's the real game changer. I was effective previously, but I also Mm. burnt a lot of bridges, he said. Now, while it seems counterintuitive, I remember him saying, he says, I actually get more done. I get more better results because people like working with me. And so he was coached. He went through, I think, quite a tough time of acknowledging how he was showing up and the impact he was having on others, but he chose that route because he knew because Gallman and various other theorists in this area talk about how salespeople with this particular skill make so much more money than those that don't. Those people that practice this skill keep their staff. Others don't. People have better health outcomes in in the U.S., Lawyers who practice emotional intelligence have fewer strokes and fewer heart attacks. So I would be saying to the CEO, do you know what? Let's see where all of you are. Let's take you all on your own journey. Some of you might be able to do it on your own through practicing some of these techniques. Others are going to need coaches because they need an accountability buddy. They need someone to hold the mirror up and ask some tough questions. But you have to put the work in, Mark. That's why it took me 18 months to become a coach, because I went on a journey and I had to do the work. This is not a two minute, two month, half an hour, half a day training session. No way. Yeah, yeah we, we we didn't get here overnight. Right. So it's going to take a little little while to unwind that. Um, I just wanted to share a, um, a relevant connection I have. So I, I offer this uh, trusted guide roadmap, and it's a masterclass for CX leaders who want to get executive buy-in. And, and the, second, um, the second module of it is about becoming a guide, right? Guide versus a hero. So you and I, before we we got, we were talking about movies and books. And so stories often, well, always have a hero and often have a guide. And the hero's in search of something, wanting to get something, struggling. There's just, if there's one thing or there's something keeping them from getting there, the guide's going to come along and provide that little bit of wisdom to help them achieve, to, to win, really, to win. 
And, and I think as part of the training, we do a, a, a stakeholder landscape and a stakeholder analysis with prioritizing stakeholders and mapping them. And then, but, but part of that guide piece is really understanding each one, once you've identified them, what their expressed, you know, and unexpressed or internal and external needs are. Right. And what, what are their philosophical needs that are, that are bigger than just the job functional items itself? As it relates to, there's no way you can do that if you don't have some level of emotional intelligence. If, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that when I watch people in any environment, I'm watching people all the time. If I watch someone who is present, in the conversation and I can watch their cogs in their brain going round because I can see that they've, they've twigged that something was absent from that sentence or they emphasized something a couple of times more than normal. Right. The ability to pick up on all of those signals is one of the mysteries and blessings of being the human species. Mm. And that's why everyone can learn it if they choose to. And the difference that people have in feeling significant, feeling heard, liking the other person, building some kind of conscious connection sets these individuals apart. I don't really know where I'm going with this, but I think I want to just say that these things are, they sound quite simple, but when we are stressed and busy and distracted and everything else, coming back to yourself is where you need to be committed to the skill. Yeah. And and that's why having your peers or having a coach or having or having your family even or some friends just bring you back to what your quest is is really helpful because they'll tell you stories i think that's where i'm going with this they'll tell you stories if you want to hear them about that time when you got that thing completely wrong or now when the conversation is completely different a bit like mike mhm mhm well, this is this is all very fascinating. It really is. It makes you think, uh, and it's it applies to both professional but also personal as well growth. And um, and I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind leaving the listeners with maybe five tips on how to improve their EI. Yeah, of course. The first thing is to consider writing down at the start of the day three things that you're grateful for. You'll be perhaps quite curious at first, like why on earth is she asking me to do that? But what I'm doing is I'm setting you up for the day in looking out for more things you will be grateful for in the future. It sets your mind to that. And also gratitude is quite a helpful expression because it also cancels out anxiety you can't be grateful and anxious at the first time the first point and the other the other thing about making a note of those three things is that you'll find there will of course be emotion within that so you're recognizing what you value so to a point that you made earlier mark you know knowing what someone knowing what is important to someone. Some people don't necessarily know it, but they know it when they experience it and doing this practice will help. So that's number one, write down three things that you're grateful for. Number two, please, if you are able to buy the book and read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, it tells you about the space between the thing and response. And and in that space between the stimulus and the response, we all have a choice. Now, I gave a task to one of my coaches once, which is to slow motion. 
play back something that's happened in slow motion, really, really slow, and figure out all of the elements of what happened in order to understand the flow of emotion during that very fast incident. And that's really what this is asking you to do. So the, the book, in The Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, he's an Auschwitz survivor and it's a short book, but I think it could be a game changer because you do have a choice on how you show up. Third thing, ask for some feedback. Mm. People you trust, ask them, how did I show up just then? It was it in best service of me and the person I was dealing with, or even the person the person you're asking feedback from, and listen. Listen to what's being said, listen to what's not being said. Download these emotional culture cards because they will give you a set of words that you could use and you can build on these words to help you identify how you're feeling so that when you can name it, you can tame it. The final thing, not everyone can do this, but if you are able to, I would highly recommend it, is to go to a place that is remote, natural, there's sounds of nature, it's very green, and sit and breathe. That sounds a little bit ridiculous, but you would be surprised at how often we just forget to consciously breathe because it is ultimately an automatic, uh, it's an automatic thing we do. But when you're aware of your breath and when you are surrounded by nature, you do get to the point where you can decompress your nervous system. We are on heightened states of alert. All of the sounds we hear, particularly in an urban environment, trigger us to think, oh, someone's going to hospital, someone's just falling off their bike. Go to nature, be surrounded in that because it is an incredible tonic if you're able to do it. Was that five? That was five. That was five great ones. <clears throat> Excellent. Nicely done. Nicely done. I have one last question um, that I ask all my guests at the end, which is what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of things where, I don't know why it was, but it's a couple of things where I, I instinctively knew at the time I need to do that thing. And I asked quite a few people, obviously it was quite a while ago now, and I didn't do it. And I just should have done it. Um, yeah. Please, everyone out there, trust your instincts. There's an amazing book by a lady called Susan Jeffries. I think I'm, that's her name. You know, feel the fear and do it anyway. It sounds like a cliche, but honestly, the other side... It was either was one, you know, one or two things. It's either not going to go as you thought, or you're going to learn something, or it's going to be the most amazing thing you ever done. I wouldn't change anything, Mark. If I'm going to be honest, because this is why I'm here, and I love what I do. Luckily, good. Well, love it. Well, all great advice, and um, and hopefully some of those resources, you know, will get from you, and we'll put in the show notes. Um, and speaking of which, if somebody was interested in you know, hiring you or just communicating with you will be the best way for them to connect with you. LinkedIn is where I hang out most days. Uh, I post most days too. So Sandra Thompson, uh, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. You should be able to find me. I think I call myself uh, an empathy expert. And not too long ago, I got top voice for emotional intelligence. So get in. Woohoo. Woohoo. All right. Well, excellent. Uh, this has been fascinating. I felt like I also had kind of a combination therapy session <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and something a little different and, and, you know, just a different perspective, a different angle on how emotional intelligence plays a role in customer and employee experience. Just well done. You are the expert. I'm so grateful that you joined me on the show. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Mark. I, I'm really appreciative. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Delighted Customers Podcast. 
I'd like to ask you a favor. If you have enjoyed this episode or any of my other ones, hit subscribe or follow. I've got a lot of other great guests that are coming up and a lot of other great content, and I don't want you to miss anything. You can find any links or references on the show in the show notes, and you can find those on my website at empoweredcx.com.